the connection with um, the homeschool community in the area and with folks from all over the state from the look of it, this is exciting. Um, and across the Connecticut River as well, I know we have some folks from New Hampshire. Um, and thank you to the uh, Springfield Town Library for hosting us and for teaching me how to use Zoom a little more effectively. Uh, and for connecting me with the Skype with a Scientist program so that I could meet Kate Evans, who I will be introducing a little bit later. So that's, it's all really cool. And I appreciate your patience with me as I figure out how this all works. Uh, let's see here. So I will start off that I am Kelly Stetner, founder of the Black River Action Team. And that is going to be the first slide on my handy dandy. Ta-da! I figured out how to do it. I'm so impressed. So yeah, I started the Black River Action Team in 2000, based here in Windsor County, Vermont. And it's all volunteer, which means I'm also a volunteer. I have a completely unrelated, separate full-time job and a family. And about 20 years ago, uh, 2000, September of 2000, I was frustrated by the trash that I was seeing in the Black River behind the shopping plaza here in Springfield. And I made the mistake of saying out loud to my husband that that's really nasty and somebody should do something about that because he elbowed me in the ribs and said, well, you're somebody. And so that first year, I started cleaning up the junk with just a couple of volunteers, including my husband. And we cleaned about three hours in about a 50 foot stretch of the river. We pulled out all of this junk. This is from our very first cleanup. And I thought, oh, good, 50 feet of the river. River's all clean, I'm done. Well, actually I wasn't, because that was only 50 feet of the river. So the next year, one of my coworkers who had volunteered said, hey, are we going to do that river thing again? I thought, sure, why not? Let's do it. And I found a terrific fellow in a neighboring town um, who recruited about a dozen high school kids to come help us out. And we worked on the other side of that shopping plaza and hauled out about 75 shopping carts just in this one little stretch of the river. And one of those students, you can see down here where they uh, we're pulling things up out of the bed of the river, you know, muddying the bottom, disturbing a lot of the sediment. And one of the students, I believe it was this one right here, came out of the water and her gray shirt was all stained with blotches of reddish brown. She was a little freaked out and I was a little bit worried too. So I got a hold of our local water lab, our water testing lab. And I asked them what they thought I should do. They sent me a bottle and explained how to take a sample and they offered to test it for free. And as it turned out, there's a lot of natural iron in that sediment. So as they disturbed the mud, it rose up into the water column and soaked into the shirt and it was just iron stains, like rust stains that you would get on your clothes. So it was no big deal in terms of her health. Nobody was you know, gonna get sick from that. I was less worried, but that light bulb had clicked on and there's more to clean water than just removing trash, I discovered. So I don't know about you guys, but I love to play in the water. This is Buttermilk Falls in Ludlow. I love to play on the water. I believe this is uh, uh, Amherst Lake up in Plymouth. And I just wanted to learn more about water quality because me and my kids love to get out on the water and I want it to be clean. I wanna know that it's, it's safe to be in and on. The Black River, drains about 202 square miles of land. That is called its watershed. And in that watershed are dozens of smaller streams and brooks or tributaries. They each have their own. Each of these little colors on this map is a, a single brook that feeds into the Black River. So each, each little stream has its own miniature watershed. And they all feed into the Black River. There's a bunch of lakes, a bunch of ponds, and I, kind of looked at that and thought, man, that's a lot of land and a lot of streams, a lot of water. So if I wanted to test and, and take chemical samples of the river all around that 202 square miles, that was going to take a lot more money, time, resources, and volunteers than I had. I reached out to the state of Vermont. I said, guys, I work full time. I'm a volunteer. I got no time, got no money. What should I do? I want to look at water quality. So they suggested that I look at river bugs. Uh, since chemical testing would really only give me 
results of certain parameters, certain chemicals in the water, certain pollutants, and only during a little snapshot of time that it took me to grab that sample, it would give me just a little bit of a picture of the health of that stream. But the river bugs, they live in and on and under the bed of the river. And they would tell me a much bigger, longer picture of the health of the water. Some of their larvae, the baby bugs, are very sensitive to different kinds of pollutants. And so they won't live where they don't like it. They, don't, they won't live where it's unhealthy for them. Um, so they are also known as benthic macroinvertebrates. That's quite a mouthful. So benthic means on the bottom, of, usually of a body of water. And macro means big enough to see without a microscope. And an invertebrate is something that doesn't have a backbone. So it's a little critter, big enough to see with your naked eye, that doesn't have a backbone and lives on the bottom of the river, river bugs. So you might know them, uh, the more common ones, as their adults. And you might not even realize that they start out in the water. So these little guys are baby damselflies. And you may, you may see these, they're very, very small usually, and they flit around. They, they're very delicate looking. They flit around the water's edge. Then these little guys are much more robust as the babies in the water, and they grow up to be dragonflies. Everybody knows dragonflies. There's a lot of different kinds of dragonflies out there. Now that's a whole nother webinar. <laughs> Um, but let's see what else you guys might know. Some people, might, if you're a fisherman or you're, you're, you go out fishing with other people, you might see these and know that they're called sometimes helgramites. Those are baby Dobson flies. And this was my son about a hundred years ago holding an adult. That's actually a dead Dobson fly. We had found it on the side of a building. But that's what he's holding in his hand is actually the adult male of that. So that's, that's a pretty big guy. Now these guys, I know that Kate knows what these are. These are baby mosquitoes. Everybody knows these guys. <laughs> I see some nodding heads there. Um, let's see who else do we have in this lineup. This is a caddisfly larvae, larva, excuse me. And it has, it's one of the species that builds a case out of whatever it's living in. So you'll see his little head and his legs sticking out at, the, at one tip of it. But that whole case is made out of uh, pine needles and pebbles and grains of sand, and they hide in there to, uh, to hide from fish. And when they grow up, they come out and that's what they look like. That's an adult caddis fly. And then this, this guy, this is a particular type of mayfly larva. This particular one burrows in the bottom of the muddy riverbed. He's got great big tusks out the front for digging up the, the uh, sediment. He's got really robust Popeye arms up at the front there for digging out a burrow. And then they grow up to look like that. And they, they will come from the river by the millions. They're super, super cool. So those are mayflies. This guy you might be a little less familiar with. That one's a stonefly larva. And that's what they look like as adults. That's what I'm waiting to see on the side of my house. My first side sign of spring is the stoneflies. They come on out and they hang out. They don't bite. They just hang out on the side of the, of the house and sometimes on the, uh, on the snow. But uh, what do these guys all have to do with water quality? Oh, good question. Well, the sensitive ones, uh, your mayflies, your, a lot of your caddisflies and a lot of those stoneflies, they really don't like to live where the water's too warm, it doesn't hold enough oxygen for them, or other kinds of pollutants or contaminants in the water um, can make it unpleasant to live there. And they will either die if, if it's a sudden, um, if it's a sudden flush of, of pollutants, or they'll just decide this is not where I want to live, and they'll kind of float downstream until they find a place where they do want to live. Uh, so what I do, the name of this webinar is bug hunting. So what's this all about? So what I do to get a sense of the critters that are in a particular stream is I will take my big long net, go out into a stream, and I will disturb 
the rocks and the bottom of the stream with my boots, or if it's not too cold out, I'll use my hands, I'll rub the rocks, and I'll loosen these little critters up, and they'll float into my net, and I'll put them in a bin. Um, and yeah, sometimes if it is really cold, I will use special gloves, because I've done this in the middle of winter, it's very cold. But uh, I'll put them in a bin, and then I will sort them out by the different kinds of bugs that I find, and I'll put them in a very expensive piece of equipment called an ice cube tray. Very, very high tech here. Um, and I'll sort them by the different kind of bugs that they are. I'll try to put all the stone flies together, um, maybe in groups of 10 so that it's easier to count when there's more than a couple in there because they move when they're in there. I'll put all the riffle beetle larvae over here, the water pennies, the dragonflies. I'll just try to keep them all separate so I can count them more easily. Uh, let's see, then when I'm done with the sorting, I count them and then I tally them all up. What I'm looking for, in the fall and the winter, it's really hard to do this, by the way. Uh, I'm trying to get a sense of how many and how many different kinds are in a particular stretch of the, of the stream or river. Uh, doing it in the winter is hard because you're familiar with creatures that migrate. They go to warmer temperatures in the winter time. These guys don't have that option. They're in the water. So what they do is they swim down, crawl down underneath the rocks, the pebbles, sometimes even down into the bed of the river. So it's really hard for me to get to them. So there's a lot fewer of them that are available for me to look at. So my target number when I'm doing this, I want to try to get 100 critters. It's easier to do the math that way if there's 100 critters. And in the winter, if I can find 25 after about an hour, two hours in the water, that's before hypothermia sets in for me. So if I can find you know, 25 or more, I'll be doing good. And then as soon as I'm done with the sorting and the counting and the tallying, they all go back into the stream and the river to live out their lives and hopefully become either adults and fly off or they will become fish food and then the fish will be happy. So one of the sites we're looking at in the Black River watershed down here in Windsor County is a pretty little brook in Springfield that runs along a street called Valley Street and where is it? It's officially, it's officially an unnamed brook, but since the headwaters, the beginning of this stream starts on a little road called Mile Hill Road, I've been calling it Mile Brook. It just makes it easier rather than saying, you know that stream on Rally Street? So this, this poor little brook has a lot of issues. It's got some, uh, some banks that are starting to erode and slide in, so the dirt gets in there and whatever's on the street washes in as well. Uh, so you get car gunk, you get road salt. Th there's some different things that are impacting the water. There's some very narrow culverts that run underneath this street this, this street, because the stream kind of meanders down underneath the street in a lot of places. And if the culverts aren't big enough, when we get a heavy spring runoff or a heavy summer rain, um, those culverts can get clogged up. They can, they can just wash a bunch of junk down through them too. It's not, not a really pretty sight. Um, there is also this old 10 foot high concrete dam that is still there. They're in the process of planning to remove it. And back in 1938, it was built to hold the town's swimming pool. This tiny little thing up in the back there was all flooded and people would, it was great. There are still folks in town who will tell tales of jumping off the high board, uh, swimming in here. It was, it was grand fun. It was a heck of a spot. Uh, but in 1953, there was a polio scare and people thought it might be better as a public health situation to close it as a swimming pool. It was still used as a spot for fishing. They held fishing derbies and such there. And then over time, the town built a new beautiful swimming pool People stop going to this spot very much. And unfortunately, this is all that's left up there. It's a lot of mud and sediment and junk, you know, old logs and, and weeds and stuff back up inside of it. And can you picture a fish trying to swim up that thing? Not going to happen. Uh, river bugs also are not going to be able to swim up or down that or, or crawl up and down that very easily. Uh, so for, for public safety and also to try to restore that stream to a more natural, um, flow regime or, or flow cycle, they're going to be looking at removing that in the next few years. Um, I love looking at that picture though. It looks like a lot of fun. 
but we're going to be, this is Mile Brook further down. There's still a lot of other impacts to this stream. There's, uh, it's armored high. You don't see much of a, of a place for that stream to spread the water out in a flood. It's stuck in a channel. Um, this is pretty, pretty standard along that stream. So we're going to be checking above that dam and then way down in, um, on, I didn't put a picture of it in there. Way down where this stream comes out, it, it flows underneath Main Street and then dumps out into the Black River just at the top of the biggest um, waterfall in town, the Com2 waterfall. So we're going to be, we'll lower a bucket and we'll pull up a sample and we'll be sending a sample from way down below and way up above to the state for some testing. And hopefully what we'll be doing there is keeping track of the water quality for years to come. So when they replace those culverts, when they take that dam out, when they fix those banks, we'll be able to watch and see the stream recover. Um, there's probably gonna be a flush of mud that comes out when they take that dam out, but we'll be able to watch and monitor and see how healthy the fish are in that stream. There are brook trout in that little stream and we'll be able to watch the, uh, watch the river bugs as well. So what we do here is look for a nice variety of critters. Everybody's probably heard that term biodiversity. We're looking for a lot of different critters. Quantity, finding a whole bunch is great, but quality and, and diversity is the biggest thing that we're looking for. And if we find a stream spot that really only has two or three kinds of critters in it, black fly larvae or um, like worms or, or leeches or something, it might have it might signify that there's there's another problem going on in that stream we want to look at. But if we can fly mayflies and stoneflies and crane flies and all kinds of fly larvae, then we know that stream's in pretty good shape. So I focus on the critters. I think I mentioned before the caddisflies, the stoneflies, and the mayflies that really require good healthy water. That those are the ones I'm really looking for the most. Um, and a part of the reason we're looking for those guys is they have gills. Um, not like fish gills. I know you're thinking fish gills, but a lot of these guys have gills and they depend on the water to be in good shape in order to, in order to be able to live. So your dragonfly larvae, I don't know if you guys have ever seen these guys, they're masters of camouflage when they're in the water but they actually keep their gills inside that round abdomen. There's a little opening all the way at the end. And if you've ever seen a turkey baster, mom or grandma or dad does some cooking and has a turkey baster with that bulb on the end, they suck water into the abdomen, the gills are inside, and that's how they get their oxygen. Stoneflies are a little bit different. They keep their gills up around their, um, up around their legs. It kind of looks like they have hairy armpits. <laughs> and when they want to get more oxygen, they sit still in the water and they do little push-ups and they pump that water past their gills to get the oxygen out of them. And then mayflies are different. They have sort of a skirt of gills. You can see lining along the, uh, along the lower part of the abdomen here. I don't know if my mouse is showing up for you guys or not, but you'll see the three tails at the end and then the long cigar-shaped body. It's got all those little paddle-shaped structures there, those are the gills as well, and they can actually flutter those. If you watch him in, um, in a little bit of water, if you ever catch one and you watch him in the water, he can flutter those gills. Um, and then some of you might be familiar with some of the non-gilled critters. I bet a lot of people know what that is. That is a leech. Um, and leeches are cool because they don't care where they live. They're good in just about any kind of water. They're not real picky they breathe through their skin. So they don't have gills at all. Um, it was kind of a fun fact. And then there are all the water beetles. They're the big ones. This guy's, I believe, a giant water beetle, believe it or not. And then this little guy, I'm gonna say that's, it's kind of a hard angle. It's probably either a predaceous diving beetle or possibly a whirligig beetle. But if you look at, his, at the tip of his abdomen, he's got an air bubble. They go up to the surface stick their backsides up into the air and they've got all these little fine hairs. They actually collect a water bubble on their body and swim down to breathe out of that like a scuba diver while they're down there hunting. And then there are even others like this water scorpion all the way at the tip of his tail, kind of out of focus, unfortunately, 
is basically a snorkel. They hang out at the surface. They're not real good swimmers. So they hang out at the surface, stick their snorkel up, they're breathing. And then when they see something they want to eat, they dive down and get it. And they and they go back up. It's just like they're snorkeling. So I absolutely love, it's, it's interesting to do this myself, but I love doing this with other people. I love doing this with kids. Um, just not only teaching them what I know, but learning from them. So many kids are able to go, hey, Miss Stenner, what is this? And I'll have to say, I don't know. Let me pull out my book because you just found something I've never seen before. And we, we geek out. Uh, this is one of my, my geek out sessions at our local library a few years ago, in fact. Um, these guys do amazing jobs finding these creatures, carefully separating them out, putting them into the bins. Um, we, we talk about the different body styles and how to tell them apart from each other. I've even gone into classrooms with kids as well. And that's kind of a whole day event because there's a lot of kids in a school versus coming to a, a library program. But it's, it's a lot of fun. I go to outdoor nature events, the local um, wildlife festival down in Herrick's Cove in uh, Rockingham, Vermont. Uh, they had to skip it this year, but if anyone's coming down next, uh, I'm a, I don't know if they're gonna be doing it 2021, but keep an eye open for the Herrick's Cove wildlife festival. If it's happening, I'll be there with bugs. <laughs> um, and then just doing it as part of the annual water quality program, kind of like I was just explaining with Mile Brook. We're going to be picking probably six or seven sites and doing bug hunts throughout the year. Uh, so yes, that's me. <laughs> Always looking through the microscopes and the magnifying glasses because you never know what small critter is going to teach you. But there's a lot of different things that river bugs can teach us. I'm, I'm going the next level and I'm collecting dragonfly larvae to, to look at and then release, but also their skins. When those little dragonfly larvae are done being babies, they actually crawl out of the water, hang onto something dry, dry out that baby skin, and then they unzip it. They crack it open, uh, kind of like you take your sweatshirt off at the end of the day. And they, just like a butterfly coming out of the chrysalis, they actually crawl out of that baby skin, unfold those long wings, unfurl that long tail, dry everything and fly away. And guess what's left behind that little empty baby skin. And I keep those, I find them, I collect them and I keep them. And I'm trying to learn which different dragonflies are reproducing here in our area of Vermont. And I'll be helping the American Natural, the American Museum of Natural History learn more about a particular species of dragonfly, one of the migratory ones. So if anyone's more interested in that, um, that's, that's a totally different program, but um, it's, it's definitely, bug hunting has led me into some really fascinating places uh, with research and it has introduced me to so many amazing people. Um, and I think Sue can share all of this with you guys later on. The uh, various ways to identify critters yourself, there, that top one is just a straight up really nice key that you can look at. You can even print the pages. The second link is an interactive key where if you collect some critters yourself, uh, you could actually get into that key and work your way through. It's a dichotomous key, which means if your creature has six legs, go here. If a creature has eight legs, go here. Uh, that kind of a thing. It'll, it'll guide you right through it. Uh, the Dragonfly Detectives Project, teach you a little bit more about the fun stuff I'm doing. And the last link is to my, my group and uh, if people want to come and learn more about that. But one of the many cool people that this program has connected me to is Kate Evans, who is going to take it from here as soon as if anybody else has questions. I kind of yeah. read a lot and went fast. <laughs> yep, there were a couple questions, Kelly. Um, okay. So is it true that leeches keep the water clean? We've already always heard this, but wondered if it was an old wives tale. I have not seen any indication of that. Um, leeches will, they, they eat blood. So they're going to go after things like turtles. And um, I don't know about the, if they ever get onto beavers or not, but fish, they'll, they'll, they'll latch onto critters with, with blood that they can suck. Um, but in terms of keeping the, the river clean, um, I would actually say that your caddis flies, that's the little ones in the tubes, um, in the, the little cases that they build, those guys go through, a lot of them are uh, 
they're shredders or collectors. They will go through and they will actually sit on a rock, scrape off the algae and eat that. All the leaves that fall into the river in the autumn, sometimes they'll go over there and certain species of them will rip up those leaves and, and either eat them or they will use them as part of their case. Um, another great janitor of the stream would be the crayfish because they're omnivores or as my daughter says, om nom nomnivores, they'll eat anything. Uh, they'll clean up, you know, if a fish dies and gets stuck in a, in a, a rock, a rocky crevice or something, the crayfish will go in there and they'll, they'll eat up the dead bodies and clean that up. Um, they, they're detritivores too, they'll, they'll eat all the yucky stuff that we don't want to talk about. So I would say leeches, no, not so much, but, but there are plenty of other critters that keep the water clean. Okay. And the next question is, um, our third grader wonders how deep the bugs go. You mean in the water or under? I, I would guess under. Okay. Or I would guess both. Under, and she says, yes. Under. That, I'll be honest with you, that is one of my geeky, geeky sides right there. Because there's the water column from the surface of the water where we all see and the ducks swim on top and everything. Then there's the water column down to the water, to, to the uh, riverbed. And then there's under the riverbed. That is, that, that is a whole nother zone of the ecosystem. That's where when it rains on the land and it comes down through the, through the ground and percolates into the, uh, into the riverbed, it feeds it from the bottom of the river. Um, and there are, there are critters, I don't know how deep they go, but that's a whole nother realm that I'm just starting to learn about. Because um, a lot of times what I'm, what I'm learning is that, let's say your damselflies will lay eggs and they can settle to the bottom of a, of a, of a stream bed. And then when the eggs hatch, those tiny little larvae, they, they can't survive, you know, floating, tumbling down the stream. So they'll burrow down in and they will live in the water in the spaces between the rocks and they'll go down underneath there. I just don't know how deep. So that's, that is a whole nother question, but give me a holler, get, get a hold of me on email because I could probably hook you up with some resources if you're curious about that. Okay. All right, so Kelly, I don't see any other questions, so please okay. continue. And I, actually, I was just gonna segue over to Kate, who is, remind me if I'm wrong here, correct me if I'm wrong, but Kate works with mosquitoes which I found very fascinating because the only, my experience with mosquitoes is ew and ow. <laughs> so I want to learn more about what Kate is doing. And Kate, you're a PhD student at the Illinois State University, is that right? Yes, that's right. So I will, I will actually escape my, uh, my screen sharing here and let Kate take the, Kate the floor. Let Kate take the floor. Um, and then if anybody has other questions for me, you can either pop them in the chat or um, I can certainly do email. So I'm gonna segue over to Kate. Great, thank you, Kelly. Absolutely. So Kelly, you wanna stop, there you go. Nice. Okay, so um, like Kelly's kind introduction said, um, I, my name is Kate Evans. I'm a PhD student in the Juliano Lab at Illinois State University. And um, my goal today is just kind of to talk about how I got to be a scientist and um, the steps along that process um, and what interests me and excited me and how I got to um, I don't know, do that. So to start, um, I do study mosquitoes, and I also have a lot of experience with um, you and Al when it comes to <laughs> mosquitoes. Um, I, we rear mosquitoes in my lab, so that means that um, I'm one of the few people out there who gets to um, get mosquito bites. Let's see, does that seem to be a universal problem? Are we not seeing my screen? I saw your screen, I'm not sure. Okay, um, I think I might've closed one screen too many is my problem. Okay, okay. Um, so I, oh, so yes. So lots of ewes and ouches when it comes to mosquitoes. Um, a lot of people, when I say that I, I do research on mosquitoes. Okay, um, try to share again, Kate. Okay, thank you. How's that? We're good. All right. Thanks. 
Um, okay, so when I when I tell people I do research on mosquitoes a lot, they'll be like, oh man, sorry, but I hate them. And I'm like, it's fine, we're on the same team, it's okay. <laughs> um, so I do research in order to um, help inform people who are trying to control mosquitoes on um, best practices to succeed in doing so, um, considering a few different ecological aspects. So I'm an ecologist, that means I'm in interested in um, the way that the plants and animals and also like non-plants animal things, so things like seasons and temperature and precipitation all interact to make um, those animal populations, so like you know, when the mosquitoes are coming out and when they're going away, um, fluctuate over time. And so I do that um, with a couple different ways. One is I do lab experiments. So we have, like I said, we have mosquitoes in the lab. And so that's a nice controlled environment where I can really um, control for like only looking at one thing at a time. So like if I change their food, what happens? If I change the exact temperature they're at, what happens? Um, I also do experiments in the field, so that's more like, um, okay, well, when they're actually in their real natural conditions, how is that going to affect their um, population over time? So how does it affect the number of mosquitoes you see later in the summer or early in the summer? Um, and then finally, I started um, doing a modeling uh, program to work with mosquitoes. So that's what that little boxes kind of on the right hand side with uh, the light blue box up top, the little dark blue box in the bottom. So that's a computer program I made up um, in order to look at, I can control a hundred different things at once and see what happens, right? So I can um, do a lot more with it than I necessarily ever could with an experiment and get a lot of data information that will help me make predictions about um, what would happen if I go into the field. And so I, Typically what my process kind of is, is I take that model and um, I look at, all right, what is it like for mosquitoes to be controlled in a really, really rainy environment versus one maybe like Texas where you're only getting, you're getting rain every couple of weeks or so. So how would controlling mosquitoes in Florida versus Texas um, change? So like what should you be doing different so that you can control mosquitoes one place versus the other? So um, like Kelly already pointed out, um, mosquitoes spend the first part of their lives as larvae in the water. Um, they also are, uh, will be pupa in the water. So this is kind of um, on the left, a, a sample from um, one of our buckets that we had out in the field. And so all the little like liney dots that you see, those are mosquito larvae. And then of course, there's also um, the dirt and leaves in there that they will feed on. So really young mosquitoes will typically feed on bacteria that is growing because of the dirt and the leaves. Um, and then as they get older, they'll start to actually break down those leaves and um, other detritus that's collected there. So uh, I know that Kelly said the word detrivor before and I said the word detritus and it's a word I use all day long, all the time. So I'm going to define it before I say it too many times. Um, but detritus is basically all of the like dead leaves, and dead insects and other kind of like debris and organic material that falls into um, places like a body of water or like a bucket. Um, and then there's a whole community of organisms that will live just on kind of that resource input. Um, so to try is really important in a lot of different ecosystems, one of them being places where you find mosquitoes. So I look at two mosquito species in particular, um, and they're two mosquito species that are really important because they transmit diseases to humans that are very dangerous. So the diseases they transmit are um, dengue and yellow fever and chikungunya that um, you may or may not have heard of before, but these are diseases that are very important and um, kill thousands of people every year, um, particularly in places um, that are a little warmer than Vermont or Illinois, um, where the mosquitoes are able to survive year round. Um, and interacting with humans there, they're able to transmit those diseases. So that's why people, uh, I mean, we're all interested in controlling mosquitoes because we don't want to be bit in the backyard when we're having a barbecue, but there's also places where they control mosquitoes so that they can protect people's lives. 
Okay. All right. So how did it all start? Um, well, I absolutely love being outside. I'm sure Kelly can relate. Um, and I love the water. I also love the forest. And um, so I got involved with several different nonprofits and environmental organizations over time. Um, there's one here in the center. I was part of an environmental association when I was in um, college. So that uh, really helped shape kind of like the people I wanted to be around and also the things I wanted to be doing. So we do things like invasive species removal. So taking out plants from forested areas that aren't supposed to be there so that the plants that are natural and are supposed to be there can thrive. Um, and so I knew that no matter what job I had, I wanted at least part of it to be getting to play outside. Um, and so enter being a scientist. So I never met a scientist until I went to college. Um, I'd heard of them, of course, and you probably have heard of some too, like Einstein or Jane Goodall, or some of the other ones represented here as cartoons, but um, I'd kind of just heard of them and, and knew about them through like documentaries that we'd watch at school or like the idea of them, but I hadn't met them and I certainly didn't know how to become one. And even the ones that I did see were often working in, in laboratory settings kind of like this, where you see like lots of lab coats and, and um, beakers and microscopes. And well, that was still cool. And, I, and honestly today I still do that sometimes. Um, I wanted to be a little bit more like the kind of Jane Goodall scientist where you get to be outside all the time. Um, so my, uh, one of the summers in college, um, I was trying to do research. I asked a couple of the professors if I could, and, um, it never quite worked out. And finally, um, towards the end of like the internship cycle, um, I hadn't found anything yet. And a new, uh, email was sent out to our biology group about an opportunity that was at the university nearby. So the University of Kentucky. Um, I'm from Kentucky originally. And so I, I went to a small college of only like 1200 people. Um, and the University of Kentucky is a really big research institution. Um, oh, we have another Kentucky person, fantastic. <laughs> okay, so I went to Center College for the Kentucky person. No, none of the rest of y'all will probably know what that means. Um, but uh, so I, uh, read through the email and it was from a group working at the University of Kentucky who had developed a new mosquito control method that would only um, target one specific mosquito species. So there's a lot of different like mosquito control programs that use kind of wide acting mosquito pesticides and stuff. So like they can spray them out and control a whole lot of mosquitoes of all different kinds, but at the same time that may very well affect other bugs that aren't mosquitoes that are important, like our pollinators, like bees and butterflies. Um, so I got this email about this group that was looking to control them in a very specific way so that you didn't um, have those unintentional effects on other bugs. And I was like, oh, this is cool. Like, I like my environmental club. This is gonna be outside. It's, you know, doing research, so I wanna do it. Um, so I joined them and, um, this here is one of my mentors there, Dr. Jimmy Maines. And um, this was, you know, I, I knew my professors at school, but this was one of my first chances in really meeting people who were scientists just doing research. Um, so I got to talk to him and another um, colleague, Dr. Corey uh, Brelsford, just kind of about like what their school was like getting to the point where they are now and um, how they got there, what they did to get there and like, kind of what their day-to-day -day life was as scientists. And it was a, it was a really cool experience. Um, so from there, I went back and finished up my college degree in biology and graduated, um, and then went back to the same organization um, based out of the University of Kentucky, this organization called Mosquito Mate, um, and continued doing research with them for two years. So I did a couple other research projects on the side in addition to this. So I also looked at, um, how, and this is actually very relevant. So I looked at um, how mountaintop removal in Kentucky affected salamander diversity populations. So we looked at mountains where, um, basically mountaintop removal is where you uh, remove, uh, they bring in big bulldozers and remove the top of the mountain so that they can access the coal underneath. So that um, it's typically cheaper and a lot faster 
and they use that coal to provide energy to people. But in doing so, um, it can cause a lot of the metals and like dangerous things in that mountain get exposed. And then when the rain comes through, like it always has, and um, the water comes down off of that um, mountain into the streams, then it can be very dangerous for the animals that live there. And so we, we looked at mountains where this had happened and looked at mountains where this hadn't happened and counted up the salamanders there and which salamanders were there, of course, because diversity is important. And there was a very significant difference in the diversity for the salamanders that lived in uh, the mountains that had not experienced mount top removal versus those that had. Um, so that was tough. And um, I, that was a, a interesting project to be a part of. It was, it was fun hiking through the Appalachian Mountains and um, the Appalachian Mountains are also a hotspot for amphibian diversity, um, one of the global hotspots. So that was really cool. Um, but at the same time, I was still doing this mosquito research as well. And so when I, I was working with the mosquitoes, um, I did a lot of field work like I was talking about. So here in the bottom picture, this is me trapping mosquitoes um, with another one of the interns there. And we would uh, see what mosquitoes were in the different areas. And as we applied these um, treatments that targeted just one species at a time, we would see um, what that what the mosquito numbers were looking like over time at the places we did do that and the places we didn't to see if it was working or not. Um, I also did a lot of uh, rearing of mosquitoes in the lab. So that means, um, we, in order to study them properly, in order to do the technique, you had to have a lot of mosquitoes going in order to for it to work. So um, I, I learned a lot of skills and how to make a whole lot of mosquitoes, <laughs> um, which most people would never wanna do, but I, I learned how to get very good at that. <laughs> um, and then finally, I, this is just a very fun picture, but I was on a special project um, trying to learn how to drop mosquitoes out of airplanes safely so that they would survive. Um, so this was me doing that and I had a little cool Ghostbuster um, suit on to um, collect up the mosquitoes that came out and see if they survived the fall or not. Um, but that's kind of a side anecdote. This is just like kind of what I was doing for two years in that research lab that I'd already done an internship with um, and really getting my feet in the water of the day to day um, like lab and, and outdoor um, uh, techniques and things to to do science. Um, and from there, I realized that like, well, it's very fun um, to do all of those things. I really wanted to be asking my own questions and exploring my own ideas as I did that. And so um, in order to do that, I need to go on and get more, go to more school. Um, so I started a master's program at Illinois State University. And the way that I chose that um, program was I found Dr. Steven Giuliano. Um, oh, I have a question. How do you find mosquitoes to capture them and how do you catch them? Okay, so I'll go back a little bit. Um, the way that I was catching them here, um, do you, you see my ghost busting gear? That's a big vacuum. And so um, the mosquitoes would actually fall and they liked that tarp. Um, so typically I could just like walk along the tarp and vacuum them up, but that was for that specific project. So um, the way that we monitored mosquito populations, so the number of mosquitoes, the type of mosquitoes in different areas was typically with these traps here. So it has um, in the inside, it has a little lure. So um, it's just like a really, really smelly thing that smells like human sweat. And um, so it draws the female mosquitoes to you because the mosquitoes want to bite sweaty humans. We know that. <laughs> um, and so if you put a smelly thing in there, then they'll want to go towards it. And then also in that there's a fan, it's like a computer fan, but it works in reverse. So it kind of like sucks in. Um, and there's a little baggie before the before the fan. So you have a fan here, you have a baggie here, and you have a smelly thing. <laughs> and so you just suck them in um, into a little baggie and you're able to, um, they, they get stuck in the baggie and you come by the next day and, and pull it out. And um, at that point, um, 
we want to count them, we want to ID them. So we'll typically kill off any of the insects that we've caught in there and like the mosquitoes by putting them in the freezer overnight. And then we take them to a microscope so that we can identify them. Um, but yeah, that's how we catch adult mosquitoes. Um, I'll get into catching uh, larvae mosquitoes here in a little bit. Um, and yeah, we will catch a few other insects. Um, there aren't really, like I remember being really exciting. It was typically like midges and things, um, but, it, and like the, a non-insect, but a spiders would crawl in sometimes and things like that. But it's really a, a trap. Like there aren't, a, we know mosquitoes well because they like to eat us, <laughs> but there is typically isn't a whole lot of other critters running around Kentucky that want to eat people besides like ticks. Um, and ticks are, are I, I believe, I, t I think ticks are more geared towards heat sources rather than the smell of humans. So the smell of humans really is only going to be attracting like mosquitoes. Um, so basically anything else we would find is just things that would fall in. Um, I do have a side story about that though, and it's that my mentor Jimmy Maines um, left a fake tarantula in one of the traps one time for me to find. <laughs> And so I, I was, you know, jumped and ran away and then came back and was very angry and didn't mention it to him so he wouldn't be satisfied and then just left a note on my um, data records for the day that I'd found a tarantula in the trap and, and let it go. And so, you know, three months later when his boss was going through the records and saw tarantula, he was like, what is happening? Um, okay, but anyway. <laughs> All right, so uh, going to grad school. Um, grad school is a little different than college. So uh, if, with college, you want to go somewhere based on kind of like the community you see there and um, how good their biology program might be, or or there's a lot of other factors going into um, your undergrad experience. So for example, I was from Kentucky. I went to stay in Kentucky, so I looked at schools only there. Um, with grad school, it's really, really important to find a good mentor because grad school is basically an apprenticeship for learning how to be a scientist. Um, so I, that was not something I knew. That was something that I learned from Dr. Jimmy and, and Dr. Corey um, over time. And Dr. Jimmy just pulled me aside one day and was like, hey, I know you like being outside all the time. I get it. If I had to redo my degree and because I like being outside too, I would go to be in this person's lab, Dr. Giuliano. And that's because he does a lot of mosquito ecology and basically anyone who does mosquito ecology has already worked with him. <laughs> so you should go work with him. Um, so I talked to him, reached out via email and we met over Zoom a couple times and then I met him in person and um, we got along very well. I, I read his research and I thought it was really interesting and that I could explore questions in the same realm. And so I, joined his lab in order to um, do research and ask interesting questions um, the way that his lab did. Okay, so um, I started as a master's student. Um, I got my master's degree about a year ago, and so then I've stayed on since then to get a PhD. Um, there are lots of scientists who have either a master's or a PhD, um, but just kind of the, the level and type of questions that you want to ask and um, the control you want over those questions kind of depends on which degree you get, but that's probably way down the future for most of you all, um, but just as a heads up. So um, while I was at ISU or for my master's degree, I um, these are pictures of the field work that I did. So you'll notice um, I have a nice white tub that seems to be the go-to uh, standard high quality equipment that we use when working with aquatic insects. Um, and uh, I have um, a bucket. This here is a uh, has a temperature monitor in it and we put rocks in it so it'll go to the bottom so we know the um, temperature of our buckets. Um, and I also got to do a short um, project at with classes because I, I take classes in grad school as well. Um, and one of them was in Costa Rica. And so we did um, aquatic invertebrate sampling. So um, the aquatic macroinvertebrates we've already been talking about. And it's a, they're amazing because bromeliads are these plants that hold water. And some of the um, largest standing water, some of the most standing water in places like rainforests are all in these like little bromeliads. Um, and inside of them, there are so many different kinds of insects that they have their own little ecosystems. They have 
like detrivores and then they have um the uh the insects that eat those and the insects that eat those and so there's like um a whole food web and a whole little e ecosystem going on inside these bromeliads so that was a really fun project to do and i did that with my friend and uh colleague rosario Mar marquin flores um and it was just a lot of fun so Okay, so I got asked earlier, how do you catch mosquitoes? And I told you how to catch adult mosquitoes, but the way that we typically catch larvae is we put out vases, like you kind of see here, there's a green, and, and we just use um, the kind of vases that you would normally find for like putting flowers out at a cemetery. So the mosquitoes I'm looking for really have adapted to prefer man-made containers because they typically will eat humans or they'll bite humans. Um, and so they're also going to be laying their eggs and um, their larvae will be living in containers that humans make. And so things like um, solo cups or tires and things like that is uh, exactly the kind of environments where these mosquitoes will lay their eggs and start their life cycle. So in order to catch them, it's pretty easy. You just put out a bunch of containers like that, whether it's buckets or graveyard vases and fill it with water and uh, the mosquitoes will come to you. So you can, um, I usually will line it with a little bit of like cardboard paper for them to lay their eggs on. And then their um, eggs will hatch and the larvae will be inside um, a couple of weeks later. Okay, so here I just wanted to show you what my experiment and my data will typically look like for, an ex for when I do experiments, particularly in the lab. So on the left here, we actually have something really cool going on. Um, so when a uh, pupa becomes an adult, so we have kind of like larvae, which are like the babies and children. Pupae, you can kind of think of as maybe a teenager phase. So it's partly between ch children and adult, and then the adult flying stage. Um, and right here, you can see an adult mosquito um, emerging out of its pupal skin. And um, from there, it's going to be able to fly away. Um, but basically in the in the lab, I will do an experiment with mosquito larvae because that's the part that we're really interested in. And then um, take out the pupae as they um, as they reach the stage of pupa, then I will take those out and put them in these little vials. And then I separate all of the individuals into vials so that I can know um, how many there were and if they were male or female, which is important because only um, female mosquitoes will bite, male mosquitoes won't. And then I can also measure their size so I can know, because typically bigger females will lay more mosquito eggs. And so um, you can judge how big the next generation is gonna be based on how big the females were from the last generation. So we put it into a, a um, science lab notebook like the one here and then transferred that all into the computer and from there we're able to run statistics and graphs and find out um, what those factors are that we tested whether or not um, they made a difference in how many mosquitoes were produced or what the next generation mosquitoes would look like and so those kind of graphs look something like this this is a survival graph so on the left hand side um, it, it goes by time on the x-axis and then the y-axis is survival. So with 100% survival when you start, so everyone's alive then, and it looks at how um, they survive over time and when they drop off and die. Um, so that's what those like little lines are, is all the different treatments of when those individuals are dying. Okay, so once I've done the experiments, um, it's very important to present your research to the scientific community and hopefully to other people too. And you will normally do that at different conferences. So there's, um, these are two different conferences that I attended um, and the presentations will either take the form of like speaking for 10 to 20 minutes about the, your project or um, you'll present a poster. So posters are kind of like standalone summaries of what you did, but you can also typically stand next to your poster and people will come by and chat at you about it. Um, so these are some of the um, important presentations I've given in the past. Um, well, important to me. <laughs> um, and so uh, this is a very important part of the scientific process. So if you've gone over the scientific process in um, school, you probably remember, you know, making observations and then forming a hypothesis and then carrying out your experiment and then getting your results. But that last step is 
presenting your results so other people know what you did and um, potentially even repeating it or having other people repeat it. Because if it's something that is true about our world, then it should certainly be repeatable by other people and other scientists. Okay, so what does my day to day look, life look like just as a scientist and grad student right now. Um, so on the left here, I am getting help from my lab mate, Dr. Chris McIntyre in um, designing an experiment coming up. And so this is just kind of like in the brainstorming phase, we get out a whiteboard, think about all the things that we already know and the things we don't yet know, and um, figure out what kind of experiment we can design to answer some of those questions. And then it's also a whole lot of reading. Um, so I read books, I also read papers that other scientists have put out. Um, and just so I can learn about what other people have done and how best to improve my own experiments and questions in the future. It's also a lot of writing and so a lot of rewriting. So you can see this is a paper that I started on with my advisor and all of the pink and red are things he changed and this is just the introductory page. So the writing process in science is um, pretty lengthy, but it's also very important. So I'm writing and then he's helping me and then we'll send it off to a um, place to get it published and they'll they'll check over it too to make sure all right, did you do the experiment well? Are you talking about this well? Is this really relevant and things like that? And that's called the peer review process. And that's to ensure that um, the science is good. So that not a lot of bad science is happening and certainly not a lot of people are, are hearing and um, repeating bad science. And then finally in this bottom corner, um, I have, I take classes I take classes and I teach classes. So in grad school, I um, am taking probably one or two classes a semester, whether it's um, in entomology or in emerging infectious diseases or more biostatistics or whatever, but I'm also teaching courses. Um, and then I had a question from Kelly. Um, is most of your research US-based for now? It is. Um, I have collaborators in other places um, like uh, in more tropical places, but most of my research right now is US based. I um, have done several field seasons here in Illinois and some down in Florida. And that's because one of the species I'm interested in is called Aedes aegypti. And they're very much a tropical and subtropical species. So they're found in much warmer places than in Illinois. The other species that I work on, um, that I worked on in Kentucky and here is Aedes albopictus. And so they're pretty related, um, but Aedes albopictus is able to survive winters. And so it can reach places up further north. Okay. Um, Ellie, so, I'm, not, I'm not sure what that meant, Ellie. <laughs> if if you want to explain your question, may, maybe type it again, hon. Okay. Or Wendy, you can unmute. I think Wendy's in the background and Ellie's watching. Um, so I'm, I'm going to make a stab here. And what I mean by day to day is um, when I'm working throughout the week, what does it look like that I'm doing? And so I kind of walked through a couple of those things, like I'm reading a lot, I'm writing a lot, I'm teaching and taking classes. So that's kind of what I mean when I say day to day. Um, but if your question is different than that, feel free to pop it in the chat and I'll answer it. All right, so what's next after um, I get my PhD? It will most likely be a postdoc. So like I said, um, grad school is learning, is doing an apprenticeship to learn how to be a scientist. Um, and a postdoc is kind of taking everything that you've learned and know how to do from that apprenticeship and applying it as much and as fast as you can. So rather than doing so much of the taking classes and teaching, I, uh, postdoc is just very research focused. So asking your questions and doing those experiments and then telling other people about it. And then after postdoc, um, 
it's kind of like a trial period, like prove yourself as a scientist period. But after that you go on um, and there's other uh, jobs and careers to be had. So the most likely and common ones for um, scientists are either working in a research lab or as professors at universities. So in a research lab, people would probably be doing more just straight research um, most of the time, whereas in uh, professors at universities are gonna be spending part of their time teaching and part of their time doing research. And um, also just because I work with mosquitoes specifically, and they're a really important um, factor for a lot of public health concerns, there's a lot of other jobs um, that at the national, state, and local government levels, like the National Institutes of Health and the uh, Center for Disease Control, um, all have positions and uh, departments devoted to mosquito research. There's even some at the United Nations that um, does research specifically on mosquitoes and um, mosquito abatement districts. So I don't know if Vermont has them. I, Illinois only has a couple, but places like Texas and California and Florida where they have that more warm oriented and um, slightly more dangerous mosquito present, um, they have abatement districts which are kind of like the, uh, a community's um, specific government organization just for controlling mosquitoes. Um, so there would also be potential positions there. Um, but yeah, so that's basically um, my journey so far and my trajectory as a scientist. And uh, I'll open it up to more questions if anyone has anything. Thank you all. I have one more quick question for you. Um, you yeah. in, in your list of um, places that you might look at for a career <laughs> after your postdoc, <clears throat> would uh, you, for USDA, would that be because there are, there are some diseases that affect livestock that are passed along by mosquitoes? So partly, um, I know there's a USDA lab here in Illinois that does um, research on mosquitoes. And it's also like the pesticides that you're using on a field to control mosquitoes may very well be affecting other insects, whether that is um, ones that are detrimental to your crops or also um, potentially pollinators and benefiting your crops. And the other thing is farming techniques that are um, man labor intensive. So if you have a lot of people working in a field or collecting fruit or something, then it is very much a concern for the health of those farmers and those workers um, to not come down with, with bad mosquito diseases while they're there. All right, very cool. I hadn't thought about that point of view. Thank you. So if anybody else has questions, if they want to unmute themselves at this point, feel free to do that. And you can hold down your space bar if you want to unmute yourself quickly. If people have think of questions after the fact, Kate, can um, Sue include your email address? Yeah, in certainly. Okay. Nice. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. I just want to um, go over, before we say goodbye, I just want to go over what, um, oh, let me get to the right thing. Oh, it's not going. Let me scratch that. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I'm going to stop. Stop. Uh, there we go. Remove the spotlight. That might help. Good deal. So we do have a couple programs that are are coming up. Cancel. Sorry about that. Um, in case you're interested, and some of them are are along with Kelly. Um, Healthy Forest Equals Healthy Rivers. That's one that Kelly's helping us with. Um, there's a Red Sox program coming up. Um, there's a, an author um, discussion. Another one with Kelly, Wetlands Are Wonderful. I think that's one of yours, right, Kelly? And Learn to Write with a Waterway Quest. And again, and that's Kelly. The Valley Quest, that's the Valley Quest program, and that's totally applicable uh, Vermont and New Hampshire, um, anybody around the state, e either state can certainly log into that. 
Absolutely. So I'm going to stop sharing. And want to thank, thank you very much um, to Kate and to Kelly. I will be sending a, a copy of the recording um, to everybody. Okay. Great.